morning, everybody. If you will please stand and come on in the church. We are going to be on hymn 105, Rescue the Perishing. Hymn 105, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it, strength for the labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them, tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Father, we sure love you and thank you for your goodness to us. And God, we ask your blessing upon uh, Sunday school hour today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Seems like we have something missing here. I don't know. Um, hey, Brother Rich is okay. Uh, so he went to, uh, to Canada uh, with uh, Stephen and, and Ricky and... Um, so he said, I'm not going to go to the game because it was a Bills game on Sunday. He said, <laughs> he said I'm just going to be up there. And he wanted to see his Uncle Frank, which he dearly loves. And, and so he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a Pastor Crone's church. Uh, and then we're going to come home in the afternoon and uh, hang out with Uncle Frank. And then we're going to go back to church. And, but he really wanted to go to the game. And I said, well, and uh, plus it snowed. You know, Brother Rich and Snow, so it snowed and it's freezing cold. Right, so he called me, he said, Pastor, you won't believe what happened. They canceled the game for Sunday and they're playing Monday. I said, uh-huh. So, uh, so he gets to, to go to the, go to, he went to Canada and he's hanging out with his Uncle Frank in New York. And uh, going to Pastor Crone's church, and then they can go to the game all day and freeze like crazy on uh, on tomorrow. So, hey man, I'm glad I'm glad that all worked out. Praise the Lord. All right, uh, how are you, Brother Woods? Uh, no, I won't say it. <laughs> now, Brother Rich usually do this good morning, adults, but I think you're going to do that. So I'll just do announcements. So good morning, everybody. Hey, um. So there's going to be a youth-led service uh, tonight during the evening service, um, and that's going to be followed by an ice cream social. Okay, so bring your favorite ice cream to share um, and enjoy, all right? Um, and pray for the teens. Just pray for them. Um, um, as they, I know they've been preparing, but it, and it's tough to come up here and do that. Um, pray for them. Um, but I'm sure it'll be a blessing. Now, there's going to be a, a Grand Prix workshop uh, uh, Saturday the 20th. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, I'd encourage you to see Brother Tim, all right? And I guess the workshop, I'm, I'm assuming that what they're doing is, because you know, when you get the kits, it's just kind of like a block of wood, and that's basically just cutting that block of wood into the shape, the general shape of the car that you want. I think that's what they're doing, but see him for more information. All right. um, there's going to be a field trip to uh, the National Aquarium up in Baltimore, and that's this Friday, and uh, they're going to be leaving the church at 7.45 a.m., if Brother Tim is driving, that means taillights at 745. So make sure you're here before that. Um, and if you haven't paid yet, that money is due. And please see uh, Miss Michelle Eames about that. And she's, she's here. She's in the back. And upcoming events, there's going to be a VBS. That's right, VBS uh, workshop. And that's going to be Saturday the 27th. That's going to be from 11 to 4. <coughs> um, and it looks like they're going to be doing some tracing of posters and maybe possibly starting to paint some of them. Um, I would say, at least for today, if you have any questions about that, also see Miss Michelle. And I think Brother Rich has already mentioned the theme, so it's, it's not a secret, but it's going to be, the backdrop is going to, the theme is Return of the King, and the backdrop is going to be sort of a medieval times um, uh, backdrop. So that's, that looks, sounds like it'll be pretty cool. Um, I'm, I always look forward to see how they decorate this place 
um, for the theme. I mean, it's, I've come in here some years, and this place is just incredible, transformed. It's just, I, I don't know. You guys uh, do an amazing job with that. Um, and then the last one I have is uh, there's going to be a college and career activity Sunday, January 28th. Um, they'll be going to IHOP uh, for dinner after the evening service on the 28th. Um, everyone is responsible for purchasing their own meal. And uh, I believe there's supposed to be, maybe there already is, a sign-up sheet in the back um, so they can give basically the restaurant a heads up how many people are coming. And if you have any questions, uh, Brother Seth, can they come see you about that? Doug Eames? Yeah. Oh, all right. So if you have any questions... Also see Brother Doug Eames. I probably messed that all up. All right. <laughs> That's all I have for today. <laughs> um, well, so let me do this. You think I have time to keep looking for it? Okay, let me do that. Yeah, go ahead. Let me, uh, just real quick, because um, uh, I have to run and, and go teach uh, newcomers class. Any, prayer, any, any prayers for today? And let me start on this side. Yes, ma'am. Rob Uyaski. I've heard his name many times. I've never tried to spell it, so I'm, don't worry. I'm, you'll never see how I spelled it. Um, uh, Gregory That's Rob. That's Rob. Yeah. Oh, that's Sarah. Okay. Um, middle section. Chris. Okay. So wisdom. And then on this side. And I was already over here. You're lucky I have good peripheral vision because I was already ignoring you. Okay. Hats be mine. Okay, brother, I got it. And can I, oh yeah, go ahead. Jacob. Brother Schumacher. Any praises? Yeah, brother. Amen. <laughs> There's been a lot of stuff going around, just a bunch of different stuff. <laughs> you, just, 
just said free sex. Okay, we're going to pray after that one. Yes, sir. Makes you a little suspicious about that dealer. <laughs> Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we do love you and thank you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house this morning. Um, and Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be able to just come to you in prayer. And just, I mean, Lord, we have the privilege to talk to Almighty God, the Most High God. And, uh, and, and you encourage us, you want us to, to lean on you and depend on you. And Lord, um, I'd like to pray for Rob Lyoski, Lord. Um, we've lifted him up to you many times before, Lord. He's got a procedure. So, Lord, I ask that you'll be with that, that it will go well, and for his health, for wisdom, for Brother Chris's sister, Lord. And, Lord, for Lord uh, for uh, Megan's uh, cousin, Lord, she's got um, there's just a lot of stuff. And uh, I know last year, last week we were praying, to, praying and, and, and we thought that uh, she wouldn't be with us this week. And, Lord, uh, she still is, but she's got procedures. Lord, we ask that your hand will be there. Lord, we pray for uh, the Brandenburgs, for the opportunities that you've given them, and, and pray for more to be able to be to minister to their neighbors, Lord. And I live for Patsy Meyer and her health, Lord, uh, mental and otherwise, Lord. Lord, there were uh, two sets of unspoken, so Lord, I lift those up to you. Um, for Brother Lakovic's mom, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that you might provide a kidney. Um, and we know what that means, um, but Lord, we just, we, just, we just put that in your hands. And Lord, for chemo, Lord. Lord, that you allow, allow that to go well with minimal, minimal, um, you know, side effects. And, uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, we thank you for the praises. And, Lord, we ask that you just bless the lesson this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, when I was in Bible college, I only got one BP. <laughs> amen. Hey, uh, sorry for bringing my coffee cup up here, but I just forgot I had it in my hand. And, um. This morning, I was looking, I mean, we, we were trying to get out of, you know, how you're trying to like get out of the house and leave, and, and uh, Lori, we're running late, and Lori's even putting mom in the car, which I normally do that, and I'm like, honey, I gotta find my coffee, I can't leave without my coffee, and, because uh, I hardly drink any this morning, I was like, I gotta find my coffee, I've been looking all over the house, I looked in every room twice, and I don't know where it is, I just had it, and she said, you mean the cup in your hand? <laughs> So it's been a bad morning already. So, hey, uh, I got to mention a couple things just because of the urgency of uh, the, um, the the time limit. Um, 
So, uh, well, we're having a couple's activity. I could mention that later, but uh, we're having a couple's activity. Um, I'll mention that in church. Um, but the Go Team activity in April is April 19th. We're going to Sight and Sound to see Daniel. It's $100 a ticket. Uh, they just, you know, it's what it is now. Um, but we have to get the tickets. So we, we need to know today if we want to go. And um, because they'll be, they'll, they just sell out. So if you want to go uh, or know somebody that would be going, just if you could let us know today. Thank you. If you'll please stand and turn to hymn number 78. When we all get to heaven, we're going to sing the first and the last hymn number 78. in prayer for the offering of this morning. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for your love for us, dear Lord. Let us just let you have your way with our lives. We thank you for the joy and the things that you give us, dear Lord, providing us our needs. Just thank you for this church, dear Lord. And thank you for your mercy and your love for us and just thank you for being an awesome God. Help us to have that relationship with you, dear Lord. Thank you for our pastor and pray for this offering that she gives for the church and for just reaching others. Thank you in all things. <coughs> in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Brother Rich's adult Sunday school class. Brother Lewis said I had to say that, so. Did you say Brother Rich? Imposter Brother Rich, there you go. Um, Brother Rich gave me a topic today, and um, I am here to talk to you today about the superiority of grape uh, or purple jelly beans <laughs> over the rest. I said, no, I'm not doing that, Brother Rich. So instead, I'm going to talk about the superiority of soft tacos over hard tacos from the book of Hebrews. No, I'm just kidding on that as well. But that's for Brother Rich. If you would take your Bible and turn to uh, yeah, Exodus chapter 31. Hard tacos. No, sir. 
Get with the program. Soft tacos all the way. One of the <laughs> compromise. Yeah. Exodus chapter 31. Uh, no, really, what I want to talk to you today about is who are you looking at? Who are you looking at? Uh, so we're going to read a few verses. Exodus chapter 31, starting in verse 1. See, Kelly, I got old people glasses. I'm in the club. I try not to wear them, but, you know. Exodus 31, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to, do, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and, all, and the table, and all his furniture, or and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the labor and his foot, and the clothes of service, uh, or the cloths of service, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his son to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, uh, shall they do. Let's pray and then we'll get into this. Who are you looking at? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of this man here and all those that you called to do the service of your work. And God, as we're going to see, they were unexpected servants. Um, but you, putting your spirit in them, called them and enabled them to do a work that was far beyond themselves, far beyond their desires or even their dreams. Uh, but God, you had a holy calling and, and you had the power to perform your will in their lives, uh, just like with us. And God, help us uh, to see a great truth today, uh, how the power is in you, the calling is in you, and our ability rests in you. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I spoiled it already. Um, my goal is not, although it's a fantastic study, to look at all the different parts of the tabernacle and the instruments and, and there are churches and groups that have done that. They've reproduced the tabernacle. You could see everything that went into the, all of that. That's not my goal here today, necessarily. But I want you to see what God called these people to do. Right? And then we're going to look at a couple of truths based on this, and then we'll move from there. But in this, in this chapter, chapter 31, the, the Lord told Moses when Moses was up in the mount, this is what I want you to do. So Moses is the leader of Israel, right? God, leader of God's people. God put in Moses and this knowledge and this understanding, this is what I want. This is the standard. You are not to deviate from it. You are not to do your own things and make your own interpretations. This is what I want. And then God tells Moses, but I've given you some people to do it. That's delegation, right? Moses had his hands full with just the people. Right. But but God gave Moses some people that could come alongside of him and, and be over this work, specifically Bezalel and Aholiab and then all that were wise hearted. Right. So. What. Did God give them? Look at verse four to devise cunning works. Uh, where is Megan in here? We were talking about the Grand Prix coming up uh, in about a month or so. Um, who has ever done that? Done one of those, the Grand Prix? See, Brother Chris back there, that's your target. And Brother Dan Pierre, they usually head it off for first and second. So they're the, they're the ones that we're gunning for right there. Uh, but I remember <clears throat> Brother Soriano, several years back, made a violin. How do you make a violin out of a block of wood? Well, you know what he did? He devised this cunning work. He saw... He saw what he wanted, which, I don't know how he got a violin there. I think he could even play the thing after he won. But he saw this block of wood, and he said, in this block of wood, 
I'm going to carve it just so. And I'm going to have the bridge and I'm going to have all the pieces and I don't even, I'm not going to mess it up. But and he had strings and he had the tuner things at the end and he even had the curly cue thing, uh, the fiddlehead, right? Or whatever it's called. He had all of that and it was beautiful. That was a cunningly devised work, right? And he says here that I'm going to give you these guys to help you and I'm going to give them uh, and put in them the ability to devise cunning works. They're going to be able to see it. They're engineers. See, Moses, what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you the blueprints. And these guys are going to be able to look at the blueprints and they're going to, or, or give you the idea and, and, and all the details. And these guys are going to be able to jot it down, give you some blueprints to follow. And then, not only that, they're going to be able to do it. Have you ever been working on a vehicle and you said, the engineer who designed this has never worked on a vehicle the, a day in their life? Been there? Yeah, there are engineers that they're, you know, they're designing vehicles that are way below their pay grade, right? Because I'm like, yeah, this, this, they didn't think that through, right? Well, these guys not only were the engineers, but they were the, they were the workers. They knew what was going on. And God says, I'm going to put that in their heart. Verse 4 again, to work in gold and, and in silver and in brass. Imagine, Hunter, they've got this, this pile, stockpile of gold. And we're going to get to some of these. Uh, they're, not, they're not there welding pieces together, Hunter. They're, they're making, I'm, I'm spoiling it, but it's great. They're sitting there, and they have this lump of gold, and they're hammering on it to, to fashion it into a singular form, like the candlestick. Right? They didn't take a little bit of gold here and a little bit of gold here and then melt it together and then so it's one solid piece. No, they, they, they formed it out of a lump of gold, exactly what it was supposed to That takes skill. Uh, I heard somebody say this about the United States. If you've ever looked at the United States on a map, this part over here, the East Coast, is all bunched together and the West Coast is huge. And it's as if, this person said, Somebody gave a guy a map and said, I want you to make 50 equal states. And he said, yeah, I got this. And then they started over here. And then they got to the end and they're like, oh, no, I got like 20 more to go. And so they're like this. Right? You ever done that? Right? Can you imagine these guys making a, a, a candlestick? And they start out real good over here. And then it's like, oh, no. No, these guys knew exactly what they were doing. By God. By God's grace, right? He had a holy work, a holy calling, and he enabled them to perform it. So verse 5 now, and in cutting of stones, a lapidary. Now, I don't know exactly. All, I mean, I, we have a list of the stones, and it's not really our purpose to go through them all here. Uh, but we have a list of the stones that went in the ephod, right, to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Now, it doesn't say if they were lustrous, you know, like the bling bling, the Leo diamond from whoever makes that. Or, you know, the, when, when it sparkles, it just blinds you, right? Ladies, that's what we like, I guess, right? It doesn't say how precisely they were cut, right? How much shine and, and sparkle that they had. But it takes great skill to take uh, a precious stone and cut it without the use of lasers, by the way, Right? We use lasers, but they had such great skill that they were able to cut these stones and polish them and set them. Right? Now, I'm going somewhere, so don't let me lose you in the details here, because we're going somewhere with all of this. I want you to see what they had to do. Back at verse 5, the cutting of stones and in, in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship, they had to make the staves for every single piece of of furniture in the tabernacle because everything had to be carried, right? They had to make the boards. They had to make the tacks, tatches, tackies. I don't know what it is. Uh, one of you Bible college students could help with that. But uh, either way, they had to make all of these boards to, what were they doing? Uh, they were framing in the building. They were building the frame, right? That had to be removable. That had to be carried, right? They had to... The, the, the altars and uh, all of those instruments, uh, the mercy seat, not the mercy seat, um, the Ark of the Covenant made out of shittim wood, 
right? Then overlaid with gold. That takes great skill and great ability, right? And then he goes on, uh, verse 6, And I have given, uh, and behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom. And so God here shows us that he has uh, a structure. Moses, Bezalel, Aholiab, his assistant, right? And then all that are wise-hearted to do the work. And so there was a lot of things going probably at the same time. Can you imagine walking into this factory and seeing the ladies over there sewing these curtains together? Not using, not using like the... Right? Not that, because there was none of that. This is low-tech era, right? And the guys over there banging on this gold, and the guys over there forming the, the ark with all this shit and wood and putting it together and getting everything prepped out, and these guys overseeing the work. Verse 7, the tabernacle of the congregation, and he's going through and he's listing, and, and uh, you could go back uh, a few chapters, and he's going to talk about all this in detail. And he's going to give, this is what he gave to Moses, the details of all of these different, uh, if you will, pieces of furniture or instruments or what have you. But he says, verse 7, the tabernacle of the congregation, the, the big building, and, and you can, it's not our purpose. But all the curtains and, and, and all the different animal skins and all the different coverings and, and, and the frame of the building, Right? Um, the Ark of the Testimony. By the way, he gives the size, which was two and a half by one and a half cubits. By the way, a, a cubit is what? Elbow to fingertip. I got 19 inches. I, I measured it or so. But it's around 18 inches. Okay, okay so it's about yay big, right? Um, and that's how big that they were to build it. He gave them the, the type of wood that they were supposed to use and the gold and the staves and the rings and all of that. He talks about the mercy seat coming up. Um, and by the way, in the mercy seat, and that's the one that's two and a half by one and a half cubits, they're supposed to make two cherubims of beaten gold, right? And, and the cherubims, if this is the mercy seat, they're on here with their wings spreading forward like this and their wings spreading forward like this. So 18 and 18, 36 and, and 9 is 45 inches, let's say close to four feet wide, right? Close to that. And so you have not only the cost of this gold, right, to build and, and beat these cherubims into shape, but the skill that's related to that. To make sure, and, and I know what mine would look like. Mine would look like this, right? And they wouldn't touch or, you know, it, it'd be like, let's try again, right? But by the way, God's house deserves the best. He does. Now we say that. God's house, right, the temple of the Lord, not this anymore, us, right, deserves the best. God deserves the best still in his, in his tabernacle. He deserves the best out of us, right? So they've got the, the, the mercy seat there, the furniture of the tabernacle, which is the table of showbread, the same thing. All the spoons, all the dishes, all the bowls made out of gold, right? All those things, the pure candlesticks we've talked about, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, the laver and the foot made out of brass, uh, the cloths of the service, the curtains, the material was mentioned, all of that stuff, the holy garments. And that's, I mean, just how the priests dressed, right? It was separate. The anointing oil, uh, they had to know the art of the apothecary. So not only are they over there beating on gold and, and, and cutting out wood, but they're over there, oh, that smells fantastic, right? I guess they would call it a renaissance man. They could do everything, right? The, the anointing air and the sweet incense, very, very specific. God said, nothing else is produced like this. And remember when they offered strange incense in, in, the, in the temple? God killed him, right? So all of these things God gave to Moses, and then God put in the hearts of Bezalel to perform it. But here's what I want you to think of. 
What was Bezaliel and Aholiab and all that are wise-hearted before all of this? What were they? They were slaves. The world thought of them as only good to just make bricks. Hey, take yourself out in the field, go get some straw, get some mud, and make bricks because that's all you're worth in this world. And, you know, the world looks at us, and, and sometimes we're guilty of this as well, uh, uh, looking at others and saying, you know what, all you're, all you're really worth in this world is just to sit there. Or, even worse, you have no worth. By the way, when Jesus talks about, uh, if they all say it's raka to your brother, right, you're in danger of the hellfire, because that word means worthless, for me to go up to Megan and say, you know what? You are worthless. Denies the power of God and the spirit of God working in her and says that is, that is probably the worst insult that you could ever pay anybody. You're worthless. You have no value. This world would be better off without you. And that's what the world sometimes thinks. These guys who are over here, preparing and making the work of God, the, the tabernacle of God, where God will dwell with them, the world said, your only worth is a slave. But God said, I've got something so much better for you than just that. I'd also like to point this out. Where did all the materials come from? They took it from Egypt, but then... Who had to give it? The people did, right? Take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 36. This is a fantastic verse that no church since then has ever mentioned, ever. <laughs> one time and one time only has this verse ever been applicable. <laughs> In fact, on your next tithing envelope, wouldn't it be great to just put this verse down for Brother Rich? I have to find it. I'm sorry. <laughs> verse 5, Exodus chapter 36 and verse 5. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment. I don't ever tell people to do this, but if you're in the habit of, of underlining, about, under, underlining your Bible, underline this. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the, the camp, saying, let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. Don't give any more to missions. Don't give any more to the building fund. Don't tithe ever again. Now, that's never going to be said, right? And Paul tells us, as a, as a serious note, Paul tells us it, it's not for him. It's for you and me. Paul says... I did you a disservice by not allowing you to support my ministry because it didn't grow you. It didn't grow your faith. Uh, one of the greatest growth spurts, if I could say it that way, of our faith is when we begin to tithe. Right? It's commanded, but it, it takes a serious step of faith to do that. And Paul said, I hurt you by not allowing you to give to the work of the ministry. But here, <laughs> we have too much. Stop bringing to the work. So you have Moses, who's the leader, and you have these, these gentlemen that, that God has put under Moses, with Moses, right? So as, as they're there working, Moses can say, wait a minute, that's not right, right? They're, they're there, checks and balances, accountability. We want to make sure that it's exactly how God said it. And then God gave them the workers that could be under them to do the work. And then he gave those that, that could provide for the work of the tabernacle. Everybody, everybody had a part to play. Now, maybe not everybody did, but everybody could. Now, I will say this before we, we move on. Not long from here, from this point right here, God's going to sentence everyone to wander 40 years in the desert till they die off. Now, I don't know how old Bezalel and Aholiab and all these guys that are doing the work are, but I'd say they're probably over 20, right? Because everybody over 20 died, and all the men that went out to war, able to go out to war, died in, wandering in the wilderness. So let me say this. 
It does not matter what you did yesterday. It does not matter what I did yesterday. Do you think Bezalel ever said, I did that? Go, maybe, maybe pride started to swell up in him a little bit. It's, that's normal. That's natural. It's not right. But we all have that tendency, right? I did that. I was a part of that. Do you think he ever looked at it, reared up, and said, wow. No, I don't know. That Bible doesn't say that. I'm just, as a man, I'm just thinking, wow, we did a good job for the Lord, of course. Right? Spiritualize it. Stick that on at the end. Wow, God sure did use me. Do you think he ever wandered around the desert saying, but God, you used me to do such a great work. Don't you remember what I did for you 30 years ago? How I made the temple or tabernacle at the time? How I, you used me to make all the, the Ark of the Covenant? It doesn't matter. See, God's no respecter of persons. And my sin yesterday or my, my service yesterday does not make up for my sin today. There, there, there's no scale. Now, I'm thankful positionally in Jesus Christ, we're, we're reconciled, right? He sees us positionally as in Christ, freed from our sin, right? Practically speaking, though, is where we fail, right? And so what I did yesterday really doesn't matter. By the way, my sin yesterday doesn't really matter either. Today does. And we're going to look at that. So, let me just peruse this real fast. Sorry. So, I'd like to, in the last just couple of minutes, think of a, a few of examples in the New Testament where God took some unlikely servants, right? And I think, obviously, of Paul. And you could go throughout. I mean, he wrote half of the New Testament, right? At least the books. Uh, you can look at, let's take your Bible, take it to Galatians, if you will, please. Galatians, chapter 1. There are so many different references. Uh, 1 Timothy, chapter 1. Uh, I love that verse. Um, this is worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says, of whom I am chief. See, Paul had such a great knowledge of God, I believe, that, that Paul looked at himself and said, I know right. He even gives this testimony. I know what's right, and I, and I don't do it. I know what's wrong, and that's what I do. And he looks at himself and says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Or maybe he looks at his testimony, his past, and, and says the same. But regardless, it's hard to go through most of the books in the New Testament that Paul wrote where he's not saying, I'm not worthy. He's just an unexpected servant where God plucked them out. No wonder why in the New Testament, Paul talks so much about the called, the elected. Because Paul, Paul was living a life that was contrary to Christ, persecuting the church. And God says, no, no, sir, I want you. And I'm not going to give up on you. And you're kicking against the pricks and you're fighting against the spirit of God. But I'm not going to give up on you, Paul. Right? Is that Calvinism? No. No, that's, that's, God, that's Paul recognizing God wanted me and wasn't going to give up on me. Wow, that's sweet. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for neither received it of, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught, taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, for ye have heard of my conversation or, or lifestyle or, or whatever life in time past in the Jews religion, how, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews re, religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. He said, I was a Jew through and through. I did everything that there was for a Jew to do and to be. And I was good at it. And I was zealous for God. Against the church and against Christ. But God said, nope. Christ said, nope. I want you. You know what he is? He, he's an unexpected servant of Christ. He'll never get saved. Now, we use Paul a lot because it's a fantastic example. But here's one. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Philemon. It's right before Hebrews. It's only one chapter fantastic little book, but here we find another unexpected servant. 
and his name is Onesimus. This is a great, if you were going to like do a play or act it out or something, this is a fantastic little thing here. And we have to uh, deduce a lot, if you will, uh, from the scriptures. But here's this man, Philemon. Paul's writing him a letter. And Paul's saying, there was a, a man, Onesimus, who at one time was unprofitable to you. Probably Onesimus was a slave who ran away. Maybe he stole from him. Maybe he just ran away. But that's, that's really how most people look at this. And he was unprofitable to Onesimus. And then Philemon, or, or he was unprofitable for Philemon. Onesimus finds somehow, whether he sought him out on purpose or ran across him by coincidence. By the way, there's no such thing as coincidence, right? And gets saved. And then Paul tells him, all right, you could die. But you need to go back to your master whom you ran away from. And you need to humble yourself and deliver him this letter. Now, I don't know what his heart was like. I don't know if he had any apprehension, but I surely would. I have this letter, and in this letter, it's, it's talking about, hey, please forgive him in my name. Forgive him. By the way, what a fantastic picture of Christ, right? Christ gives us a letter to take to our Heavenly Father. We deserve to die and go to hell. We deserve eternal fire and judgment. And in Christ, he gives us a letter, which is his blood, that says, forgive them. And we are able to take that to the Heavenly Father with hope, with assurance that he's going to accept it. Now, I don't think Onesimus had that. You know, he could die for being a runaway slave. He could be beaten. But here he is taking this letter from Paul saying, hey, forgive him, receive him, not as a servant, but as a brother, right? He's highly profitable to you. Take him back. And by the way, if he's done anything, put it on my account, Paul says. What a beautiful picture of Christ. But here, this runaway slave, just an, an unexpected servant, right? Right? How about John Mark? John Mark went, and I don't have time to go through all the verses, but in, in Acts chapter 15, uh, Paul and Barnabas are still together, and Barnabas uh, is, is, I guess, his uncle, John Mark's uncle, and he says, hey, let's take Mark. And Paul said, we're not taking him, because he, he left. He, he, de he departed from the work of the ministry. By the way, if you've ever read Paul's ministry, probably most of us, wouldn't like being beaten on a daily basis. We probably wouldn't be able to hang with the Apostle Paul, right? And for whatever reason, and the Bible doesn't say good or bad, mom got sick, doesn't say any of that. Maybe he got a kidney stone. I don't know. But he decided that I need to turn back. And Paul said, he ain't coming with us. He quit on us. And they were so sharply divided that, that out of that one missionary team became two. Paul went this way. Barnabas went that way. But take your Bibles and turn, if you will, just back a couple pages to 2 Timothy in chapter 4. Paul says something about John Mark later on that, that's sweet, if I can say it that way. I don't know. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 11. The Bible says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. You know, whatever, whatever their division was or whatever his problem with Mark was, if they wrote letters and made up, I don't know. But he recognized something. He's not useless. He may not have been with me here, and I would have loved for him to be here with me. He may not have stayed the whole time, but he's not useless. By the way, after this... Do you know what John Mark goes on to do? Write the Gospel of Mark. Isn't that something? God wasn't done with him. May not have been exactly what Paul had uh, in the ministry that Paul had, but God had something for that young man. And he completed it. Gives us the Gospel of Mark. And then one more in our last four minutes, you and me. Right, you and me. Some of us are just unexpected servants. And if we would take the time to go through and hear each other's testimonies, 
you would be able to just say, this is where I was, and then this is what God did to bring me here. I'm so very thankful as I talk to my wife sometimes about my past. She said, I can't see you like that. I could never imagine you like that. And some of us have that same testimony, right? You know what we are? Unexpected servants. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and they overheard a conversation and were a part of a conversation where some, some ladies in the church, it doesn't have to be ladies, it could be me and you and any one of us, but some ladies in the church were talking about somebody and their past. And how their past limited whatever their work and their service today. You know what? I love that verse. So let's turn there. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. Because this is what the Bible happens to say when, when we want to look down at folks. And by the way, that's what tonight is while you're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Where we're going to have the youth from the little people 